Thank you so much. Always great to chat to you. Um, so we, we saw the announcement just a little earlier this evening from uh, the, the, the office of the, of the Chief Justice saying that it's all going ahead virtually. Um, am, am I correct in my understanding that that will go ahead purely to quickly postpone, as it seems both parties are in agreement that it should be postponed? Most likely, yes. The matter will be postponed tomorrow, mainly because the accused person, one of the accused persons, is not present. Uh, he's currently in hospital, so um, it would not make sense in any event to proceed with one of the most important people in the case, which is the accused, is not there. Um, I'm not sure what happened because I think I read somewhere recently that the matter was supposed to be heard in person and that the person was supposed to be present there. But obviously, now with what's happening uh, now, he's now you know, unable to attend the, the hearing. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's yeah. probably because both parties say, well, it'll be quicker to do a quick Zoom call rather than trek to Peter yeah. Maritzburg and do it all in person when we know that it's likely to be uh, postponed. Of course, it's just one yeah. more delay. What is likely to happen mm. after this? Is it about waiting for the former president to get well enough to appear in court and that's simple? Or is it juggling a million diaries? No, 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 it's actually that simple. So the procedure is that um, the accused is not present before court. So what happens, a warrant of arrest is, is authorized but stayed until a certain period. So we'll get indication from the um attorneys as to how much time they think that he will need to be to, to heal from whatever is ailing him currently. And then um, perhaps it's two to three weeks, a month, whatever the case may be, the warrant will be stayed for that time. And then on the next occasion, if he's still not present, then the court court procedurally should um, authorize the warrant of arrest uh, or extend the, another stay if there's sufficient evidence or, or compelling evidence that he will not make it in any event. And then matter will be postponed again. But if on the next occasion he is wealthy, I uh, mean, sorry, healthy enough to appear before the court, then he appears and then the matter proceeds where it, it basically left off. Right. OK. So the issue uh, uh, that has to be heard is this issue of Billy Downer, uh, Jacob Zuma's uh, team saying, look, this man is biased against uh, the former president. We don't want him heading up the prosecution team. Um, that matter, of course, is not going to be discussed tomorrow, more than likely. It's going to be quickly postponed. So I don't want to dwell on that now. But I do want to ask you a little bit more about the fact that the former president is in hospital and it is unclear and, and my colleague Tulisi Zwisimilani tried his best uh, to find out from correctional services whether this is uh, an unexpected illness that has landed the president in the medical unit um, at the correctional services facility or whether this was a scheduled medical checkup. Uh, is it very clear uh, w which one it was or is it impossible to say from this perspective? I think right now it's, it's impossible, um, but I do recall that one of the correctional services personnel made a statement whereby they said that it is nothing out of the ordinary, it is something that was expected, so we can assume that it's something that was probably uh, disclosed when he first started his sentence, that in such circumstances he would need to go and, and have his health checked. Um, but I think the attorneys of that is will be the ones who are more in the know of what is exactly happening with him. And and they'll be the ones who will disclose to the court what they are allowed to disclose. Because remember, mm. his health is also protected Correct. by the uh, doctor privilege and, and everything. And also the attorney-client privilege as well. So he can only expose only what his client would allow him to expose to the court tomorrow, which is sufficient enough to grant a postponement. Yeah, and of course, let's not forget, he is a 79-year-old man, and we also know that he hasn't been vaccinated against COVID-19, or certainly hadn't when he was taken uh, into prison. Um, if, if it indeed it is just a matter of very bad planning that his medical um, checkup was scheduled for exactly the time when he was meant to be in court, would that surprise you? I'm trying to get a sense of the levels of communication and efficiency between correctional services and the courts. Well, um, 
<laughs> I don't think there's communication between the courts and corrections. So actually, I know there isn't because um, the people who will, who will communicate with uh, with correction services services would be the NPA, the prosecution. Because when you go and your matter is postponed, there's a form that needs to be signed that has to go with the correction services. So the magistrate or the presiding officer will then sign on the form with the date and everything, and then the NPA will dot it on the docket, and then they will make communication using the court clerk as to when the accused should be brought back to court. So the court, as in the, the judge or the presiding officer themselves, will not have direct communication with, with correctional services. But NPA should have an idea of what's happening um, if it is indeed within the best interest for them to know on an ongoing basis. So if um, this was already going to be uh, uh, in the cards, um, then they would have known in, 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 in advance. But however, remember, he was still trying the whole um, rescission application and he did not go into custody at the time he was supposed to go. So this might not have been something that was discussed prior, only when he then officially went into custody. And it's something that it, was, it most likely was communicated with the state and also with his attorney so there can be some, some open line of communication that, look, there's a possibility that this would happen if our rescission application does not go the way that we mm. hope it will. All right. So at this hour, of course, it could be a situation as simple as that, that it was just a, a bit of bad logistical planning. Or, indeed, uh, the former president is, in fact, quite unwell, though by all accounts at this point uh, we're being told it is just a routine check. I want to speak to you a little bit about uh, the application for medical parole because we know that the former president is making that application as well. What do you need to prove to get medical parole. I mean, all of us remember Shabir Sheikh, uh, and it seemed that he got medical parole quite easily because it was spotted on golf courses months after he received his parole. But, but talk us through, legally, what are the correct requirements for medical parole? So you need to have a history, it doesn't have to be lengthy, but you need to have a history of a medical condition that cannot be um, addressed by the, the medical staff within the correctional services. So, for example, um, what can I say, uh, a cancer treatment um, that, that is specific to leukemia or whatever the case may be, you need, you need to go and have um, um, your, your, your monthly checkups and have your chemotherapy and all of that. If you can be able to prove that such medical conditions cannot be addressed by the, the medical staff that is assigned within the, the, the correctional services, then it shows that you are entitled indeed for medical parole. So it's just a matter of proving your medical records, having an affidavit by your attorney, as well as um, uh, medical uh, health by your medical practitioner, rather, and then an affidavit usually that was handed in to the, to the correctional services. It's a formal it's a formal application, but not under the court realm. And then the medical parole, the medical parole board would then look at it and weigh up and see if indeed everything that you've put in there is sufficient enough for you to be released out on medical parole. It really isn't that hard of an application or intense for that matter. I think that's why Shabir Sheikh got it so easily because you must remember that even though it is a, a public, it's a correctional services, it's public a public health as well. Public health is limited to certain extents. We don't know what kind of medical condition that Azuma is in and what he needs. So, and what he has been, because he has been traveling overseas to go see doctors. That's why he wasn't appearing in the, um, in the Zondo hearing and all of those things. So he has alleged. So now we are now in a situation where if he's going overseas to go seek medical attention, then most likely correctional services does not have the facilities to assist right. him. So therefore he will be successful in that application. All right. Well, thank you so much for breaking that down uh, for us. That was attorney in Tabiseng Dubizane of Dubizane Attorney.